Good evening, everyone. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Good evening, everyone. How are we feeling tonight? We're blessed. We're feeling blessed and highly favored. Are we feeling blessed and highly favored, Bridgerine? Are right, we feeling good then? All right, we're ready for another message tonight. Good evening to those who are watching online. Welcome to another night of our Let's Talk About Team series with speaker Pastor Roy Dennis. Tonight, we'll be looking at making the right selection. Now, I specifically remember Pastor Dennis asking the young people to come out tonight. And I'm hoping that our young persons are tuning in online. And if you're online, I'm just inviting you to share this message with a friend, share the link on your status, your IG story, your IG notes, anywhere, by any means possible, get the word out there. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Most righteous and eternal Father, thank you for today. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. Thank you for strength. Thank you for being who you are, Lord. Lord, I pray that as we're about to worship you and to glorify your name, Lord, I pray that you will just be with us. I pray that we'll sing praises unto your name, for you deserve it, Lord. I pray that even as our speaker, Pastor Dane Story, delivers your word, I pray that you'll just use him as a vessel for your work. Thank you for everything you've done for us, and thank you for what you continue to do in your name, I pray. Amen. I now invite our praise team for our praise and worship segment. Amen, amen. Let's get it all started. I am blessed. I am blessed. Every day of my life, I am blessed. Oh, when I wake up in the morning and I lay my head to rest, I am blessed. I am blessed. Oh, I am blessed. I am blessed. Every day of my life, I am blessed. Oh, when I wake up in the morning, till I lay my head to rest, I am blessed. I am blessed. Jesus is my deliverer. Jesus is my deliverer. Jesus is my deliverer. I know he delivered me. Jesus' name so sweet. 
invite us to just join me in standing as we have a word of prayer. We invite our friends online to join us as we petition the throne of grace. God of glory, God of mercy, and God of love, our creator and our redeemer, we thank you this evening that you have given us another opportunity to come to worship. We praise you with everything we've got, emptying ourselves of self so that your spirit can have its own way in our lives. We thank you for journeying mercies to be here tonight. We thank you for protecting us along the busy thoroughfare. And we thank you for all those who are joining us virtually as we are here gathered for worship one more night. We pray that your spirit will be upon each of us, that your mercy will attend us, and that your joy will be accomplished in each worshiper. So here we are gathered, O oh God, we pray that you will bless your manservant as he speaks tonight. May souls be drawn closer to you, and may all lives be touched by your spirit. Into your hands we give ourselves, and help us, O oh God, that as we come to the, through this service and come to the end of it, each one will be able to say, I walked with God tonight. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And thank you for answering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A pleasant good evening to one and all here at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Mandeville. We are again delighted to have you in our virtual space those who are following online. Let me say pleasant evening to the folks from Mike Town District of Churches and also the poorest district of churches. And this evening, the online viewers from CJC are on with us. We say welcome to all of you. Trust me, you are in for a power-packed experience this evening and we just await this blessing from the Lord. Let me say that this evangelistic thrust is impacting people across the globe. Whether you are in the United States or in the Caribbean islands or you are in the UK or Canada, we have viewers from across the globe and we are again delighted to have you. Listen, just let me remind you about our Grand Singles Connect on Sabbath. I told you about it last evening. And I will share it with you again. The place to be on the 13th of April at 7 p.m. is right here at our church hall for our Singles Connect Social. And again, I will share with you our Grand Couples Recommitment Service right here the 20th of April at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Register right here and come be a part of this great recommitment service. And third, our prayer breakfast on the 21st of April at 7 p.m. at the church hall. You cannot afford to miss it. And let me say, there are persons lining up for baptism on Sabbath. I heard a testimony today of how the Lord spared a young lady's life purely miraculous and she's given her heart to Jesus and I know there are many more of you who have testimonies come share it with us and give your heart to Jesus Christ before it is too late there are gifts for those of you who are here you will receive them on the outside Bibles steps to Christ and many more gifts in are, are in store for you remember to share this link with a friend Invite somebody here, and may God continue to bless you always. Good evening, everyone. We've truly been having a wonderful time here in the house of the Lord. Uh, so this evening, we continue with our health nugget on the eight laws of health, where I will be focusing on trust. And just to briefly mention what the eight laws of health is all about for those who are 
hearing about it for the first time. New Start uh, is a new choice of a healthy lifestyle program. And its acronym for the eight lifestyle principles as goes as follows. So New Start is N for nutrition, E for exercise, W for water, S for sunlight, T for temperance, A for air, R for rest, and T for trust. And I'll be looking at tonight. One will ask, what does trust has to do with our health? We just want to look at the meaning of the word trust. The Greek word for trust is ibis tos simi. And this is being translated as being, having a confidence, reliance, faith, and loyalty. And I just want to briefly look at this translation of trust. So it, it's certainty, it's belief, assurance, this confidence, unquestioning belief in and reliance upon something. And let me say upon Jehovah. As Isaiah 26 verse 3 reminds us, it says, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. And so this perfect peace that the scripture is, speaks about and as um, Psalm 119 verse 165 says, great peace have they which love thy law. So it is not an ordinary peace we get when we trust in the Lord. It's perfect and it's great as the scripture says. And we must understand that in the midst of this peace, it doesn't mean that it's, we are absent from trouble and from problems. But we look at what Psalm 27 verse 3 says. Though an host should encamp against me. My heart shall not fare. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. In this what? In our trust. In our belief. In our confidence in Jehovah. We will have, we will build our trust. We will remain calm. And so, as a result of having this level of trust in our Lord Jesus Christ, he gives us this peace of mind which allows us to relax, to remain calm under pressure where there is confusion and chaos and people around us, you know, they are worried and anxious and agitated. We are able to think clearly we are able to analyze situations objectively and make best possible decisions. Whatever happened, whatever challenges, we are able to recoil. We are happy, you know, and the, there's joy in the soul because of this perfect peace, this great peace that the scripture speaks about. And as Paul reminds us that, um, you know, we learn to be content. It is this peace why we are we, we able to be content. As Paul says in the scripture, that um, he learned to be content. And he have learned to the secret of living in every situation. And it is all because of trust. Without peace of mind, you might eventually begin to notice symptoms of anxiety, stress, sleep disorders, the sleep disturbances, and um, this is now you have problems staying up asleep and having trouble sleeping. You will be starting having aches and pain 
and lack of energies. Digestive orders, these orders will also develop as a result of not having a peace of mind and you will also experience some heart diseases and other health issues. When you feel relaxed, when you are feeling anxious and stressed, our body releases hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol. And these cause the physical symptoms of anxiety such as rapid breathing, increased heart rate, increased sweating, and the body goes into fight and flight mode because of imaginary threats. And so, the body, it's very important for us to obtain this peace so our body can be in a state of equilibrium. Uh, I don't know if media will be able to show. Just want to look at something here, right? When we are calm, when we are relaxed, we will notice, this is an uh, echo, echocardiogram, that's the, the pattern of the heart rate. The, the top reading shows normalcy. So the pattern of the graph is showing that the body is relaxed. And so when the, this peace that we get from Jehovah, the Holy Spirit, you know, our bodies, we are so unique that the, the hormones that releases, the dopamine, the, these hormones, the, the oxytocin, the, the serotonin, they release and relaxes the, the heart muscles. And so what the dopamine does, it inhibits the, the, the flow of aldosterone. And this hormone that will cause heart rates to go up and don't to be fluctuated. And so you're looking at the bottom reading where it shows an abnormal reading. This is when the body is not relaxed. The body is not in a state of equilibrium. And so you have abnormal reading. And so it is important for us, the children of God, to have this uh, peace of mind that the Lord wants us to be in a balance mentally and a balance physically. And I just want to look at what Proverbs says. Um, Proverbs 3. Thank you, media. You can take that down now. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. When we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not unto our own understanding, but in all our ways, we acknowledge him and he shall direct our path. The Lord bless you as we continue to trust in Jehovah. Have a good evening. It is that time of the evening again when we gather here to collect the offering. May I just invite the ushers to come forward. Let us stand as we pray for the offering. Our great God and our loving Father, we truly thank you for a wonderful day. We thank you for your faithfulness towards us. And as we come into your sanctuary this evening, we know that you're going to bless us. We ask that you will bless the evening's offering. May it go to the furtherance of your work. And as we give, help us to remember that we cannot out give you. Thank you for your love and your mercies. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gives me blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. I've been to a lot of places and I've seen millions of faces, but there are times for the theme song.
Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful for life. We are grateful for the privilege to be in your presence again. What a God you are. You're a great, big, wonderful God who is worthy to be praised. Tonight we have come into your presence. We may not have all that we want, but we have what we need because we have Jesus. Come into our hearts. Come into our lives. I pray that by the power of your word, you will transform lives and families tonight. Bless each heart gathered here in this sanctuary and those who are joining online. May each one understand that no time spent with Jesus will be in vain. So we pray for a great blessing as we worship you, Hyde Roy Dennis, behind the old rugged cross of Calvary once more magnify the name of Jesus in this place. In his name we pray. Amen. Good evening everyone and thank you for joining us again for Let's Talk About Him. We are talking about families. We are talking about the love of Jesus and we are also talking about the prophecies. It's good to have you those who are joining online, we are happy for your presence with us. The poorest district and from the Mike Town district and also those who are joining uh, from the CJC online platform. We are happy to have you this evening. Uh, this is our second week and indeed it has been a blessing so far. What do you say? And so we want to thank you. We want to thank in a special way our visiting friends who have come. And we trust that you will receive a great blessing as you worship with us this evening. I have a gift for the persons who are planning to get married soon. Um, if you're planning to get married soon, I have a gift for you. Just put up your hand. We have enough. Uh, by faith. All right. Pastor, Pastor Brown, you're going to do the honors this evening. Just keep your hands up. I have enough gifts. All those who are not yet married and you would want a gift tonight, just raise your hand. Pastor Brown, I see two hands, one here, one there. All right. Those who are online, just keep your hands. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Pastor Brown is going to give you a gift courtesy of the Jamaica Union Conference. Thanks to the administration. More? All right. All right. And um, I hope Pastor Brown took one for himself. Did you take one for yourself, sir? <laughs> all right. All right. So we had a hand here, so we are going to give you. For those who are online, we are sorry you're not here this evening. Uh, but if you plan to get married soon and you reach out to us, we can, we can always consider giving you one of these books. All right. Um, up front, Pastor Brown, there is one hand close to the front here. Okay. Keep, just raise your hand again so Pastor Brown can see you. <laughs> okay. Okay. More, more. A lot of people getting married want to get married tonight. All right. All right. So we have some gifts for you. And we're asking you, don't just put it down. Read it. Some of the principles that we are going to discuss. If you don't plan to get married, well, we don't have any gift for you tonight. We are going to, we're going to have another night where we're going to talk to those who don't plan to get married. All right? But tonight is for those who plan to get married, who want to get married, and we have something for you. All right. All right. So the subject that we are dealing with tonight is making the right selection. That's the topic for this evening. Uh, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, parenting the right way. 
that's the subject for tomorrow night. And on Sabbath, the subject is victory in Those are the topics for this week. And so we look forward to another wonderful experience for the rest of the week. Let me, let me, I want to inform you that this coming Sabbath is going to be a big baptism. Amen. Amen. What did I say? It's going to be a what? Big baptism this coming Sabbath. We want to thank God for those who are signing up because they want to make heaven their home. Praise God for them. We already prayed, so we are going to go into the message for this evening. Making the right selection. Making the right selection. There are some things that we need to prepare for in life. Young people need to be prepared for a career and profession. If you are going to get married, before you can get married, you need a profession. Amen? There are a lot of persons who you ask them, what can you do? And they said, I can do anything. Anybody who tells me that they can do anything is not a, is not a specialist in anything at all. So you need to become a specialist in something. And if you are going to be a specialist in something, then you need a skill or a degree. You need a what? A skill or a degree. Every young person needs a skill or a degree. So you need to be prepared with a career or profession. You need to be prepared for marriage. In Jamaica, as I mentioned before, 66% of Jamaicans never get married as long as they live. In the church, even in the church, we are preparing people for a profession and we are preparing people for heaven. But the Seventh-day Adventist church doesn't necessarily have a culture of preparing people for marriage. We need to encourage our children. Parents, I'm talking to you now. You're encouraging your children to be a lawyer and a doctor and a nurse, and a teacher, and you're encouraging them in profession, but marriage is still honorable, and the bed is on the file. So we need to prepare for marriage. And thirdly, it's there in the middle, we need to prepare for our eternal destiny. Those are some things that we need to be prepared for in life. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and verse 24, Therefore shall a man do what? Leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be what? One flesh. So the Bible speaks of marriage as an important thing. Marriage is important. And, and I normally say to young people, even though there are many persons who disagree with me, that the years in college or university, this pointer keep running away, the years in college and university are the best years for dating. So, so some people will disagree, but those are the years when young people are together in a large group. And they get acquainted with one another. And the true education, Ellen White says, is not just the pursual of a particular course of study. It has to do with the, the whole development of the being and the whole period of existence to man. And so it has to do with the mental, the spiritual, but it also includes the social. Young people need to establish social relationship that can lead to marriage. So young ladies need to relate to young men. And young men need to relate to young ladies. That is why I personally, a lot of persons disagree with me on this too, I personally don't believe in the single-ed school where all the boys go to one school and all the girls go to one school. From the children are born, God made them male and female. Little girls must play with little boys. And little girls must, 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 I tell you, when my, when my daughter was in preschool, they had a little banquet. And she went, and they, they, the girls would have to sit with the boys, and they would eat with knife and fork. And, and so she came home. She said, Daddy, I know who I'm getting married to. So I said, you, you do? She said, yes. So I, I, well, I wasn't there, so I wasn't sure who this boy was. But, so I asked Mommy, I said, you know, 
Mommy says, yes. So I said, tell me who. She didn't want to tell me. She was scared to tell me. So I said, all right. So I met him, nice young man. And I said, all right. She can go out with him and use knife and fork, but she's not going anywhere else with him. <laughs> I'm watching you. But, but, but it is important that girls learn to interact with boys and boys learn to interact with girls. And, and what happens with this single-ed school? And I, I, I met a pastor who went to an all-boys school and he, and he defended the single-ed school because when I made a statement and I said that, listen, when the teenagers, uh, their emotions are, are running and they're practicing, they practice with male with male and female with female and they tell themselves that they are gay when they are in this setting. And so, so it has negative implication. And, and that does not mean that everybody who goes to single-ed school are exposed to this. But I am saying it opens the door for that. God wants male. God made what? Male and what? And female. So, so during those years, you must interact in a way that can lead to marriage. My, my, when I was dating at college, my, my wife used to tell me, said, my mother says, boys and books don't agree. And I've maintained from that time that it is not boys and books that don't agree. It's boys and it's, it's, it, it's books and sex. Because when you get involved sexually and you're not married and you're not mature enough, it will blow your mind. And you can't focus on the schoolwork. But studies have shown that, that, that if you are married people who, who, are, who are satisfied sexually and who are studying at university, they do better than other students. So if you're married and you have the license and you are comfortable and you are mature enough, it is good for you. One person say amen. Just one person. <laughs> But if you're single and you're not mature enough, then that's when it will be a problem. So, how do you make your choice? How do you find a good woman? What are some of the principles? So, we're talking to the men now. First, a good woman. Men. A good woman is... Oh, we, we started with a good man. All right, let's go back there. We missed that slide. A good man. We're starting there, ladies. A good man, number one, integrity. A good man is a man of what? Integrity. And what is integrity? It is saying that you stand up for something. They said if you don't stand up for something, you will fall for what? For anything. So any man that you're going to choose must stand up for some principles. Integrity. Number two, ambition. Now, ambition, my mother used to say, Roy, ambition takes you a far way. And listen, ambition is not something that you can give to people. Ambition is something that comes from within. So, so you could have somebody who have money and is ambitious. That's good. If you have, some, if you have a man who does not have money and is ambitious, you can take a chance with that man. But if he does not have money and he's non-ambitious, then run for your life. Emotional maturity. A good man must be emotionally mature. I see a principled person. Assertiveness and communication. Ladies, your number one need, this is where it is. The ladies want communication. The majority of divorce cases in Jamaica, petition in Jamaica, and basically around the world is over this matter of communication. The ladies are saying, I can't talk to my husband. I can't talk with my husband. So, so, you, so some ladies will take the man and there is no communication and you're going to marry them hoping that when you get married, he will communicate with you. Do you think it works that way? No, it gets worse. So you need someone who can learn how to communicate with you. A good man is a caring personality. He is caring. This is where the romance come in. 
You know, and the, you know, so he, 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 will, he will be concerned if you're not feeling well. He will open the car door for you. And, and you know, you know and, and I'm saying this in public. The, ladies, you need to learn how to appreciate good men. There are some of the young ladies now, they look for the rough man who shove them around. And you think that that is cute. And when you get married, you realize that you're in an abusive situation. And some of the young ladies don't know a good man. I, I, was, I, was, I, was at a, I was at a store one day and I saw a nice, beautiful young lady coming towards the door. And since I was at the door as a gentleman, I was told that I should open the door. So I opened the door. Beautiful, nice young lady walked through. She said, thank you, sir. There were two other ladies coming older than myself, much older than myself. And I, out of respect, I said, as a gentleman, I must stay and open the door for them. So I did. And when I opened the door, they passed through. They didn't say thank you. One of the women said to the other one, loud that I should hear, is who tell him, say, we are look man. For the foreigners, who tell him that we are looking for someone? <laughs> So there are some persons who don't know a good man. You need to know somebody who is caring. A good man knows his boundaries. No is no. He should respect your views and respect your perspective. And a good man is truthful. You have some men who think that they must always have reason to be carrying your own a corner. And they can't be straight. Where are you? And they are... They, if, where are you? I am in Mandeville in the supermarket. They will tell you something like, I'm on the road. I'm on the road. Where? Could be anywhere in the world. I'm on the road. You know, I don't take the statement, I am five minutes away. I remember I had a counseling session and the people were to arrive from 6 o'clock and I was there 7 o'clock and I said, where are you? And they said, we are five minutes away. Now, I was in the vestry at Spanish Town and they were in traffic in Kingston. And they are five minutes away. Some people use that. They are not straightforward. So I want to know, where are you? I am at ferry in traffic. So a good man is truthful. All right? So those are, there are other principles, but those are some key principles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven is God's number. You can find many more online. So I'm going to give now seven principles, a good woman. So we talk about the man. What are some of the things that the woman should look for? What are some of the things that the man should look for? Should the man look for qualities in a woman also? Of course. A good woman is respectful. Notice we'll put communication way up on the top of the woman's list because the woman wants romance and communication. One of the biggest needs that the man has is for respect. Men want to be respected. And some of you men think it cute when the woman curse you and put you down. But when you're married, you're not going to like that. So choose somebody who is respectful. A good woman is supportive. Men love support. Men should support women too. Are you with me? Because sometimes the men are used to support and when the woman needs support, they're not supporting them. Men, you should support your wives in their profession. My wife is a teacher. A lot of people, at one point when I was at Central Conference, a lot of people would ask, is she your secretary? This is the quality support that she has given to me. That sometimes people thought that she was my secretary because she was always there and she was always involved. It makes sense that I will give support to my wife also. So sometimes she has a big function and she has a big seminar and I just dress up and I show up for her. I'm there. And as she, she grows in her profession, I need to be there to help with the children too and to give her the support that she needs. So the men need to support the women. But women, you must know that men's support is important to the men. 
Good woman is supportive. A good woman is emotionally mature. There are some women who give the impression that because, oh, you know, during my period, I have different times of the month when I have different mood. So I can talk to you anyhow at a certain time of the month. No! It's better to be quiet than say the wrong word. Control your emotion. So don't curse me and put me down because you're in a bad mood and tomorrow you're in a snuggly mood and you want to come and snuggle up on me. Doesn't work like that. Manage your emotions. A good woman is emotionally mature. A good woman has purity and integrity. And I use this somewhere else and they say, what about the man? Should the man have purity? Well, we talk about integrity for the man. You see... Um, I have noticed that, listen, there are so many men who have been unfaithful to their wives for five years, for ten years, and sometimes the wives live in it and forgive them. But the man can't bear if the wife cheat on him. He die, he can't come back from that. So while I'm saying to the man you should be faithful, I am also saying to the man, make sure that you find a woman who is faithful. Are you with me? And who has integrity. If you choose a woman who is giving you competition from before you marry her, believe me, she's going to give you trouble after you marry her. A good woman is industrious and ambitious. Let me come to Proverbs here. Read a few verses from Proverbs. A good woman is what? Industrious and ambitious. Industrious and ambitious. Text here from Proverbs 31. We're going to read a few verses, 10 to 22. Proverbs 31, 10 to 22. The Bible says here, Proverbs 31, and from verse 10, Who can find a virtuous woman? And her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not what? Evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and the flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like a merchant ship and she bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it was yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maiden. She considereth the field and Buyeth it, and the fruit of her hand she planteth in the vineyard. She girdeth her lines with strength, and strengthen her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, and her, she, sorry, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hand to the spindle, and her hands hold uh, the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for the household. For all her household is clothed with scarlet. Verse 22, and you can read the rest when you go home. She maketh herself covering of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. So this is an industrious woman. The concept that because you're a professional woman, you must not learn to do anything is wrong. So while today we are saying men need to learn to cook, we are still saying that women need to learn to cook. What do you say? So there are many women who are saying, all right, uh, because I am a professional in my field and I can, I can, I am a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a teacher, I'm this, I'm going to bring in money, I'm going to be a breadwinner. What we have today is two breadwinner and two homemaker. So the man has to do things in the home and the woman still has to do things in the home. Ellen White would say in her time that a woman should learn to ride a horse, a young lady. Well, I am saying in our time, a woman still needs to learn to cook. A one amen I get. It's just one amen. A woman needs to learn to cook. Men need to learn to cook, women. So men will say, it look cute and, and you go to the restaurant. It's okay when you go to the restaurant, but there is nothing like a nice home-cooked meal. 
All week, last week, when I go home, I like to have a little snack after I preach, Dr. Peter King. And I, I, I don't have anything heavy, just a cup of tea, and I was eating pumpkin cake that my wife baked with her own hands. Pumpkin that, I, well, I was going to say I planted with my own hand, but God have a way of blessing me, Doc. The neighbor's pumpkin climb over my concrete wall, which is five feet. And, 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 and the neighbor was cutting his yard and cut the pumpkin vine. And I said, Lord, he's going to die. And, and another neighbor on the other side said, Pastor, leave it alone. Seventh-day Adventist neighbor, let it stay. It will bear. The pumpkin plant bear two pumpkin. Amen. Without a root. From that same neighbor's yard some years ago, under when it was chain link, their banana plant migrated, and I saw a banana sucker coming up in my yard, grew in my yard, and then their plant died. So now you will see the banana there and think I planted it in my yard. I didn't plant no banana there. So, so, so the neighbor's things love my yard. They love to bear in my yard. And from the pumpkin I, that the Lord provided, I didn't even plant it. My wife provided pumpkin cake that I can enjoy. <laughs> that I can enjoy. Industrious. And there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. Uh, so, so, my screen is gone. Yes. So, the, 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 the wife must be industrious and ambitious. A good woman to you must look good. Must look good to whom? To you. So people like beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Some men like a slim woman. Some men like a thick woman. Some men like the shape of the hips. Some men like the hair. Now when you're doing interview and you ask the man. And I told you when I met Keisha. You'll hear a little bit more about it. One of these Sabbaths. Uh, I, I, one of the things I liked first about her were her eyes. I could see myself with children with those eyes. So now I have eight of those eyes in my home. <laughs> her eyes. Very attracted to her hair and her eyes. And so, so beauty is in the eyes of the what? Of the beholder. So up front, she must look good to you. And there are some people who give the impression, oh, you know, because I'm a Christian, physical attraction does not matter. It matters. God give us a head to make a choice. So don't come and spiritualize things away. And then when you come and you marry the person, you're looking at, other, looking at Pastor Dennis' wife because he chose one that is beautiful. Look at your own wife because you chose her. When you choose somebody, you must see yourself with them for the next 40 years. A good woman. I'm going to use this word now because I'm using the word interdependent and accountable. And I could say independent, but I shy away from that because of how the word is being used in North America and in the Caribbean today. We have some women who are saying, I'm a strong black woman. I'm an independent woman, meaning that I have no need for man. Coming from the feminist theology. As a matter of fact, when I was doing my doctorate, I learned about the womanist theology, which is rival to the feminist theology because the feminist theology says, we don't want any man around. The womanist theology is now saying, we believe that the men are co-equal. You know how the feminists think? I was discussing with, with a female pastor. And she was talking about the disparity between male and female with salary. That if a man is in a position and a woman is given the same position, she gets less salary. And I, I agreed with her and I said, I believe that if the woman is given the position, she should be given the same salary because she is equal to the man. She looked over her glasses and scoffed at me and said, if he's equal, the woman wants to be equal to man. She don't have no ambition. So, so the feminist is saying, he said, you know, a friend of mine, a, a cousin of mine would say, she should have boxed me in my mouth. <laughs> so my, my friend, because I, I was trying to defend and I was trying to defend the right. But, but she, 
she, what she is saying is that, listen, it was once man's time, now it is woman's time. Listen, God never made it to be man's time and woman's time. Once the men were educated, once the men were exposed, once the men alone were in leadership because they were the ones educated. But the society has changed and the women are educated. God never intended that the man should lord it over the woman, nor the woman lord it over the man. God made male and female. We are co-equals. So, listen to me. Women need men. And men need women. Even if you don't want to get married, that's your business. But I say women need men and men need women. If the woman go ahead of the man, she will never be safe. You can, you can get your nice big SUV and put alarm system on it. And you can get into your townhouse and burglar bars and cameras and, and whatever you want. If the man wants to take it away from you, if the woman run ahead of the men and the men are not equipped and the man wants to take it away from you, he will find Find a way to take it away. So women need men and men need women. If the, if the man run ahead of the woman, he will never be satisfied. And if the woman run ahead of the man, she will never be safe. So we need one another. What do you say? Yes. Interdependence. Genesis chapter 24, we see a selection. Genesis 24, 1 to 4. Abraham instructed his servants to go uh, to his father's land and to select a wife for his son Isaac. Abraham's servant went with prayer and supplication. And, and, and when we're going to select someone, we mustn't do the selection without Jesus. Don't just look, don't just let the eyes do the choosing. Let the principles and the word of God guide your path. What do you say? So Abraham's servant went with prayer and supplication and found a woman of class and integrity. Found a woman of what? Class and integrity. The Bible describes her as very beautiful, still a virgin and mature enough to be married. Amen? So these are some key things to bear in mind. So what is the process that leads to marriage? This is the process and you will see it in the book. Starts with friendship. Friendship dating, friendship dating courtship, friendship dating courtship engagement, friendship dating courtship engagement marriage. So that's, that's a chart you will find in the book um, that I have put out there. The process that leads to marriage. So we start with, and we're going through that chart now in the message line. What about friendship? What does the Bible say about friendship? You must choose people who have similar principles and standards as you do. Choose people with integrity. Show me a friend, I'll tell you who you are. Choose the right. Not everybody is your, going to be your bosom body. Not everybody, even those who are getting baptized in the church, is not everybody that is in the church you can tell your secret. And when it comes to choosing someone to be your friend and even a partner for life, that's a decision that you have to make. When we are doing premarital counsel, we discuss even health, people's health. And so you need to choose. For example, we ask persons about illness that runs in the family, like sickle cell traits and, and like hypertension and, 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 and any other. We talk about sexual transmitted infection. What if you're, you're dating someone and the person has HIV and you are dating and you find that out? What do you do? Is it prejudice to say, I can't go ahead with this relationship? Is it prejudicial? No. That's a choice and a decision that you have to make. So it is. If both of you have sickle cell trait, you have a 50% chance that your, every child may have a 50% chance that they might have full-blown sickle cell disease. So you are dating and you find that out in the council. You can make a decision that I'm not going ahead because I cannot afford to take this risk. You might find somebody else after that or you might not find somebody else. That's a decision you have to make. 
choose the right person. So you make the choice. Number two, true friends are interested in the other person. There are some persons, there are two ways that you can love yourself. There are some people who love themselves so much that they can't love anybody else. That's selfishness. Love myself. Everything is for me, myself, and I. So I asked people in their individual session, do you love yourself? They said, yes. What does that mean to you? Because I want to know if loving themselves comes with the responsibility of sharing with others. Matthew Henry in his commentary says, there, 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 there's a type of love that is selfish. And that type of love must be put off or mortified, must be killed. But there's a type of love that is the rule of duty that you take care of yourself and you take care of others. So true friends are interested in others. Have you ever had a friend who sometimes when you see them coming, you want to run? <laughs> is that really your friend? Because they always want something from you, but they never have anything to give. True friends will listen. True friends are loyal. So you choose the right person, now you're loyal. True friends will share their feelings with each other. And true friends don't expect perfection. Listen, no matter how good you are and you choose the right persons, you must know that in a sinful world, they will make mistakes. If you have never made any mistake, put up your hand in life. Never need any forgiveness, never made any mistake. So we all need forgiveness. And number seven, true friends are willing to forgive. So that's friendship. The next stage is dating. And there are two definitions I normally give for dating, even though most of the young people today disagree with one of them. And I say dating can be a formally structured affair. Everybody agree with that. But the other definition I find is that, is that, that I have given is that dating is spending time with someone that you like. So some people will say, I, don't, I didn't go out on a date. People, relationship has been formed when you never intended it. But you're dating. You're going out with the person. It may not be a formal affair. Listen, anybody you spend a lot of time in their presence communicating with, you will establish a relationship. Some type of relationship. Are you with me? So, 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 people date and they form a relationship and ultimately... They realize that they are even courting now. But they never planned to be dating. They never, they never structured anything. They never organized a dinner. They never decide that we are going to go to the beach together. Or we are going to go this way. But they were spending a lot of time. And they were getting acquainted with one another. And they were getting to like each other. And they were excited about being with each other. You're dating. And you know, young people nowadays have this thing, they say, he's just my friend. You have this nice young man that you're going out with, and you are going out and having dinner, and you're laughing and talking, and you make another young lady from the same church come and take him away, and then all of a sudden, you alone, and, and listen, he's not going to be able to spend as much time with you anymore, because now he's a married man. And his wife going to say, come home, you can't be talking another, with another female so long as... And that time, now you're sorry that you never marry him. He's just my friend. <laughs> and, and you know what? Some of you don't see the good in him. And some of you don't see the potential for the relationship until another woman wants him. That time, now you're ready to fight tooth and nail. So, come on, open your eyes. I'm telling you that some of you are dating and don't know that you're dating. <laughs> but it can be intentional. It can be planned. So, in Bible times, the process that leads to marriage was not dating. It was betrothal. So, your wife in, was selected. Come with me to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Matthew 1. Verses 18 and 19. 
Matthew 1, 18 and 19, the Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being just a man, and not willing to make public example, was minded to put her away privately. So this is betrothal. So the parents had selected the husband. Generally, back then, the parents would select an older man who would provide for and protect their daughter. It was not necessarily for romance. They would, they would choose somebody who would provide for and protect. In the East today, there is still this system. I had a classmate while I was doing my master's who, who, was, who was doing the master's here in Jamaica, but her husband was selected back in Bang Bangladesh. Never met him. But when she go back home with her master's degree, she was going to be married to this man. So we jokingly said to her, what if you find a nice little gentleman out here in Jamaica? She said, well, I could not go back home. Because my parents have already selected my husband. So the question I want to ask you, therefore, young people, would you like your parents to make the selection for you? In the Bible times, they would choose the best person who would provide for you, and the parents would never choose somebody who they think is going to hurt their child. Generally. In the Western world, the culture has changed. It's not there in the Bible. Some people want to be strict with the Bible. And so if you want to get betrothed, then that's your business. But the Western world, it is dating and it is, it is, a, it is, a, it is friendship and then what? Dating. And dating now comes with some challenges on its own. So let's look at them. Illicit sexual activity. So when you are betrothed, you would meet the person. But when you're dating now, you meet the person and you're interacting with them. Abuse. Unwanted pregnancy. And broken heart. So one of the things I would say, church, dating is the process of the Western world. So facilitate that in the church. And I can say from my home church where I grew up that the older persons would, would help to guide us. By the time I was dating properly, my mother would have died. My father is not a Seventh-day Adventist. I benefited from the guidance of, of my wife's mother and from the brethren at my home church to help us to date in the light. If young people are dating and they come to church and sit together and they are not and, and they might go out together in public spaces and they are not going into any corner, into any dark places you must facilitate that and help to and, and older persons would just call us aside and find out what's happening and what's your intention and help to give you a little tip here and there and so the church, don't just leave the young people alone and you don't care if they're married. You want them to be a doctor and a lawyer. And you want them to lead out in the church. But you don't help to facilitate it. The church needs to be more interested. In this, we need more married people in Jamaica. And the prime minister is saying they need more married people to have children. So we have a lot of work to do. Because people who are married and when, you have, when you're married and you have children within marriage, it creates a stable society. And that's what God intends. So, dating. Then now the broken heart. Every, almost all of us who are happily married today can say, maybe the person we are married to is not the first person we dated. And we have had our hearts broken. Yes. You go home and weep. And you can't eat for six months. Your heart is broken. It comes with depression. Shame. You wonder if you're good enough. Low self-worth. Psychological trauma. Grief. Worse if they're gone in another relationship with somebody else. You feel like you're good enough. You're not good enough. Insomnia, you can't sleep. And loss of appetite. But those of us who are married can say to you, beloved friends, that listen, 
when this is not the end of the world, pick up the pieces and move on. So when you're dating, one of the things I would say, don't make any serious commitment when you're dating. Dating is not the time for that. If you're going out and you're just casually relating to person, don't make any serious commitments. Because when your heart is broken, it can be bitter for you if you've gone deep like you're married. You're not married till you're married. And one of the things that, that, that the young ladies are saying is that as soon as I go out on a date with a young man, he wants to have sex with me. But the young men are saying, young ladies, that as soon as I go out with one date with a young lady, she wants me to marry her. You must know that if the young man goes out with you and have a plate of dinner, he's not ready for marriage yet. He's not reached marriage state yet. So if, he, so if you hear that he goes out and eat dinner with somebody else, just... Keep your cool and see what's going on. So you would have had, I have had my heart broken. You don't believe? Yes. And many persons have had their hearts broken. So, 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 and we survive, amen? We survive and, and listen, listen, when... When, when, when uh, um, you know, growing up, uh, the, everybody wanted tall, dark, and handsome. Nobody wanted the short, dark, and handsome. So when we had the little thing, Johnny was a miller, and he lived by the mill, and the mill went round and round. And you're going round, and you go, I, used, I didn't like social. I didn't like social for the fact that many of the games were, were the, the social was to cause male and female to interact and young people to interact but some of us end up sitting on the church step you never get somebody to go around on the mill with yeah nobody pick you and it was painful for me but 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 when i met keisha and I walked into my home church one Sabbath after we were dating. Serious now, courtship time now. And I walked into my home church. All eyes looked at She was the most beautiful girl in the church. Short, dark, and handsome. Somebody wanted him. As a matter of fact, one of the young men had the, had the, the guts to come and ask me, where you find this beautiful girl? So listen, listen to me. You might not have things your way and you may feel hurt and rejected, but there is still hope. Come on, say amen. I remember there was a young lady that I liked from my home church and, and while I was in college and I saw her and I was so happy to see her. And, and when I, my, my family was poor and when I ap approached her, she took the other side of the road. It took me a long time to get over that. This is somebody I sang on the choir with. This is somebody that we are in. But she took the other side of the road. Poor. Broke. But ambitious. And when they did not see that. Keisha saw that I was heading somewhere. Signs. So, so you broken heart. So how do you get over that? Work through your feelings. Avoid self-blame. There are some things that you may have done wrong. So when you're dating, use this as an opportunity to evaluate and to say, if I did something wrong, how could I do it better? Forgive yourself and forgive the other person. Somebody break your heart and... Oh, you're bitter with them for the rest of your life. There are some people now, you know, they are 90 years old and they have not dated anybody else from their 15. Somebody break their heart and they're bitter with every man. Every man a wicked. Every man is a wicked. One time your heart was broken. So avoid self-blame. Forgive and move on. Self-care. Occupy yourself. And get professional help if you can't get over it. Talk to someone about it. And you will find that it is not so serious after all. Listen, they, 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 
some, a lot of people say, boy, they can't find nobody. And I always talk about Nick. Nick from California. Nick don't have any hands and any feet. And you know him, he's online. And Nick marry a nice, intelligent young lady. And Nick have two, maybe three children by now. He uses mouth because that's what he has. A lot of people say they can't find anybody. And no man knowing at the church. And, and they can't find no woman. I, I, and, and I can understand because the male to female ratio in the church is 2 to 1. Some Sunday churches is like 10 to 1. Uh, and, and as we get older, we find that we have less men than women because more men are in prison and more men die quicker than women and so on. So, but, but when a man is going to tell me that he can't find a woman, boy, boy, that hard. I, I was doing an evangelistic campaign. And while I was doing the campaign, I was invited to a house to do a wedding. The man said he wanted to marry and baptize. When I went in the house, Dr. Peter, he's a blind man. So, so I, I said, I normally ask this question, how are you going to take care of your wife? How are you going to provide? The man says, Pastor, look through the back door. I looked through the back door. There was a vast field in the back door, pumpkin, planting, Green banana, coconut. The man had acres of land. And the man says, Pastor, all of that you see in there, I planted. He said, that my job, I'm a farmer. And, he, and that's why we put on the thing. He's a farmer. And he says, he, says, he says, the people from the market, they come and purchase from me. He says, the only problem I have is that the ones who have two hands and two feet and can see, two eyes to see, they come and steal it before, before it... it, 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 it and he said, I know when they are ready, but they just, get, they just cut the plant in a little bit before I could get it. Blind, and he's saying, he's marrying this woman, and they are getting baptized, and, and, and she don't have to worry. He had his own house, and he had his own farm, and yet there are people with two hands, and two feet, and two eyes, and, and, and sensible, and rational, and they can't find a woman. You know what I said to one young man one day? I said, listen, your problem is that you don't know how to clinch decision. Bible workers know what that means. Bible workers know what that means. That you're going on and on and on, and you don't know when to say, listen, no, we have to do something about this relationship. Let's get married. Factors that influence attraction. So the, we're moving on now. So dating. And then now we're moving on to courtship. We're transitioning now. So what, what causes you to make a decision now that this is going to be a special relationship now? I'm going to zero in on this one. And I'm going to, to separate myself from all other relationships and make this an intimate relationship. So these are some of the factors. Proximity. Nearness. Oh, Yes. You might like the fact that the person is in Japan or in the United States, but how long are you going to maintain that relationship? So there's a young lady here in Jamaica, and there's a young lady in Japan that likes you. If the one in Japan not coming to Jamaica and you can't go to Japan, you don't have any, well, I don't know if it's visa or whatever. Ultimately, proximity is going to determine what decision you make. But you know what? Some Jamaicans are foreign-minded that they leave the one out here and they take the one abroad. And then they have challenges. If, if you can go, that's fine. Proximity, nearness. And not just nearness physically, but in terms of religion and so on. Familiarity, exposure to our knowledge concerning the person's situation. Similarity. So we sift. There are two words that determine success in re the relationship. It is com compatibility and complementarity. And we are focusing tonight on compatibility. Um, but complementary, com complementarity is when you are different. There are some ways you should be different. And compatibility is some ways that you should be similar. So you start with the similar and you sift. And then you look at areas of differences that complement each other. So likeness, you're alike in religion, you're alike in, in, in the family background, you're alike in educational status and so on. Uh, reciprocity, giving and receiving. We're, when we look at personality, you're going to see that, that. That one person talk and the other person listen. One person give the joke and the other person laugh. Reciprocity. 
physical attractiveness. The person must look good to you. Amen? And I know the ladies don't emphasize this as much, but I imagine the ladies want the men to look good too. Am I right, ladies? Yes, whatever it means, that the man should look good. Yes. And differences now, we talk about complementarity. So, uh, now that you have gotten the attention of the person, now you're going to sift. And so Kirchhoff talks about the elimination process. It is not likely that you will only be attracted to one woman or one man for the rest of your life because you choose one. You, 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 you are likely to be attracted to other persons physically before you're married or after you're married. So this is the, this is the young man now. This is the man. There are three beautiful girls in Mandeville Church and, and three of them, they, they will sit beside him from time to time. They go out to do Bible work. They, 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 and so he's getting acquainted with them. They sit together at lunch on different occasions. And guess what? He, relationship is building with all three, but he don't know which one to choose because all of them pretty. Well, and I've had young men who say, boy, I don't know what to choose. I say, well, God give you a head. Choose. Can't be going on with all three and, and, and causing them to feel like they are the special one. If you can't choose, so you need to choose. Make a choice. And live with your choice. So you use your principles to sift. So you, we're going to show you what are those principles. And you use those principles like your religious beliefs and, 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 their, you know, and, and, and education and, 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 and family background. And you sift and you make a decision and you live by your decision. So as long as you're dating, you're going to see other girls. You have the prettiest girl, but you're going to see somebody who looks prettier than the one you're dating. What are you going to do? Run after the prettier one every time? You're sadly mistaken to think, even if you're married, that the only person that might catch your husband's eyes or that might catch your wife's eyes. And there are some men you know, who think that, boy, I'm married, but other women are attracted to me. Don't think that other men are not attracted to your wife. So you better be careful what you do. Because the same way you respond to those women is the same way your wife could respond to the men. So you need to be responsible. When you make your choice, stick with your choice. So this is the meat of the matter. We try to tie it up. Elimination process. Now we are talking now, we're going into now courtship. Courtship. So you eliminate based on proximity, social group, physical attraction, compatibility, and compensation. Proximity, we talk about nearness, the relationship, able to function because you are there physically or emotionally, nearness. Then we talk about social grouping. Oh, um, all right. So you might be African, they call him African-American, what we call black people, we call us in Jamaica. You're black from African descent, and you like the Chinese, the Asian descent, you like their eyes, and you can see yourself with children with those eyes. But you have to ask yourself, can you live within the culture? So, so the, it, it, is it a Christian culture? They said, if there's one nation that eats everything that walks, flies, swim on the face of the earth, is the Chinese. So not every Chinese eat everything, but you now have to decide if you can, can eat the steamed fish from the same pot, pot rather, that the other thing is cooked in. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> so social grouping is important. And, and, and there are some people who marry into a social group that... All the rest of their lives, they are fighting to be accepted. They're never accepted into it. So you have to make that decision. Social grouping, physical attraction, we talk about that. And we say physical attraction is important. And the compatibility, that's the one we're going to close on. So let's say compensation. Is compensation important? What you get out of the relationship, is that important? 
Oh, we say, oh, don't just marry the person for money, but if the person don't have the capacity to make money, would you marry them? You're not marrying them just for money, but they must be able to make money. The Bible says money answer it all things. So you must be able to make money to provide. So would you marry a man who don't have the capacity to make any money? Put up your hand. Ladies. And compensation for the man, it might be other needs that the man has. That he says, listen, I will compromise on this thing. But there are some things that I will not compromise on. I must get this out of the relationship. So nothing, you go in there with the intention to give. But there are some basics that you should get out of the relationship. Marry people that can help you to grow spiritually. That's one of the things that you should uh, get out of it. All right, so we... The Bible says now, as we look at the final one, which is compatibility, and narrow it down, that you should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And a lot of persons think that this is prejudicial. What is God saying here? Don't be unequally yoked with unbelief. And we see evidence in the scriptures of Solomon and, and Samson who marry outside of the Jewish faith and they got into trouble. Samson lost his life because of these decisions. Plucked out his eyes. Cut off his hair. What God was saying is that the Jewish nation who believe in him should not marry intermarry with people who believe other gods. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we, we hold to this principle. Now it's your choice. And the church is not going to throw you out if you marry somebody outside of the church. But there are some consequences that are inevitable. If you marry somebody, who you, when you're going to church on Sabbath, they are going to the market or to the party. You're going to have some differences. And when you have children, it is going to affect your children. If you marry even somebody who worship on, maybe two churches that worship on Sunday or two churches that worship on Sabbath might be closer. But if you marry somebody who worship on Sunday, when you have children, where are they going to worship? Many of these children come up not even believing in God because there's a tug of war in the house over religion. But it's a choice that you will have to make. So unequally yoke is purely on religion, but compatibility now are on these principles. Age, marry someone within your generation. If you want a romantic, vibrant, fulfilling marriage, marry somebody within your age. There are people who marry outside of their generation, but they marry for different reasons. There, a woman who is 25 may marry a man who is 50. She call him daddy. That's what she call him. But if you want one where you have pillow talk and where you have romance where you hold hands and walk and you make decision together and you have a heart to heart connection, you must marry within your generation. And some say a generation is 30 years. Here we are talking about 10 years. Within 10 years. Preferably the man older than the woman. Because the women mature quicker than the man. And, and some men never mature as long as they live. <laughs> Age. Education. Now, now this is where I get a beating men. We're, we're in, in the past. And, and one lady, one of psychologists, she spoke about it. She says when she went to the UWI in the 70s and 80s, the majority were males. But since the 90s and 2000s, the majorities are female. 75% when I, when I was doing my, my master's and I looked at the, the statistics. NCU did the research. Uh, UWI did the research and UTEC did the research. 75% of those at university level were females. It's changing back now. I looked at the statistics for 2020 and it says 59% of those at the universities are female. What is this saying? Now we have the woman with the master's degree and the doctorate degree, but the society still says that the man is the main breadwinner. So we have a problem in our society. 
The woman cannot find a man with a master's degree because it's not equal across the line. And then now she's going to marry a man with, with a high school education. That man is bringing in $100,000 per month. This woman with her master's or doctorate is bringing in $750,000 per month. And sometimes either the man feels intimidated or the woman puts him under pressure, say he must carry his half. How am I going to carry half with $100,000? So she is going to go into a gated community with an expensive SUV and he can hardly afford to live in a one room, but she wants him to carry half for a gated community house. And some of the men say that when that pressure hit them, they are so stressed that they can't even perform in bed. Under pressure. We're going to talk about that when we talk about budget now and, and family finance. That, that it is not impossible to work, but we have to change our views. If the woman gets the education and works the money, the man is not the main breadwinner if he's working less. He's a co-breadwinner. In many homes today, the woman is the main breadwinner. As a matter of fact, I can tell you, I know working relationship where the man stays home and takes care of the children and the wife is the main breadwinner. But some of us, we can't manage that. And many marriages have been destroyed. And some men are saying, boy, we're going backwards because the man should provide. If you, our society never equips some of the men to provide. I have articles of the mother who would send the boy to push hand cart in the market and the boy would spend the money to send the girl to school. Which girl with her master's degree is going to graduate young lady and marry the man like her brother who pushed the hand cart? So we need to educate and equip our boys. That's something that the church needs to facilitate. Are you with me? so that we can balance the equation and there are some ladies who don't like it when i talk about equipping men because they believe it's woman's time and and they clap and i i went to a seminar and a minister of government was talking and saying him no mind have only women around him like a bull in a pen but but i am saying we need to equip the men in the nation and that will lower the crime level. And in the church, it will provide more men for the, your daughter to find a husband. Amen? I remember we had a program and they gave scholarship. They gave 10 scholarships. The conference and all 10 scholarships were given to girls. We sit at the church board and when a girl writes a request, we send them on to education. But the boys, you know what we tell them? The young men, go see if you find a job. And I, and I, and I approached the, the department that was responsible for that program. I said, listen, don't allow this to happen again. I said, if you are giving out scholarship to the constituency, even if you have to find a different criteria, make sure that you equip the boys and the men. So do it 50-50. Give them a different criteria if you have to do that. And the following year, they did that. Education. Men, I'm challenging you. Many of the men, you drop out of school, you hide from school, you don't want to go back to school, and you're not equipping yourself, and you're telling me, that some of you, that you work more money than, this is another point that we're going to talk about, you work more money than the, the, your wife. Listen, you may work more money than your wife, but you are not able to communicate at her level. Many women are willing even to finance a man who they can talk to, than to live with a man who they can talk to with a lot of money. You're going to live with your money alone if you can't talk with your wife. Communication is important to the woman. Men, equip yourself. Read a book. Take a seminar. You hear all the men quiet on me in here tonight? Amen. 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 Upgrade yourself. Amen. And listen, nothing is wrong if the lady you're moving on to your bachelor's and your master's and the man wants to go back to school, that you encourage him and take a pause, man. Don't go to doctorate yet. Give him an opportunity to upgrade himself. Come on, say amen. It is in your interest to do so. 
Your health, compatible in health, similar. Culture, we talk about that. Family, values. Listen, if you marry somebody whose family is used to abuse and this is what they are used to, this is how they respond. If you marry into a family that all they know is obvious, then that is going to affect you. And personality, finally, personality, personality type. Now, personality is a wide term. But, and I've seen many definitions of what personality looks like. But one, one thing that runs through all of these definitions, or one of the principles, is temperament. So there are different aspects to personality. But temperament is a part of all the definitions on what personality is. What is temperament? Temperament is whether you're outgoing or reserved. And there are four types of temperament, sanguine, the choleric, the melancholic, and the phlegmatic. So the sanguine wants to have fun, do things the happy way, needs attention and approval, is led into temptation when they receive no compliments, and their mate does not laugh at their humor. So the person, the sanguine is the life of the party, they run the social they don't just don't they are extemporaneous when they're preaching and when they are talking they will just talk from the top of their head but because they do that they will make a lot of mistakes and sometimes we'll have to apologize the sanguine the choleric is a leader outgoing but the choleric is more organized than the sanguine Likes to do things their own way, needs achievement and appreciation, and is led into temptation with their mate, does not get things done, and does not appreciate his or her achievement. Those are the two outgoing personalities. One is strong and organized. The other one is outgoing and more peaceful uh, uh, and just free flow. Melancholic, these are the reserve now. The melancholic, these are the people you see dealing with paper. They prefer to deal with paper than people. Sometimes around the desk. <laughs> they, they are sometimes around the desk. They deal with the money um, the, in the accounts department. Well organized and they will do well with the figures because they are not going to make any mistakes. Well structured, well organized. Like to have perfection. Likes to do things the right way. Needs order and sensitivity. And is led into temptation when the mate lacks sensitivity to his or her need. And life is no longer in order. Order. If life is not in order, they are frustrated. The phlegmatic wants peace. I have a friend who was, his dominant personality was phlegmatic. And so while we were at college, um, um, I said to him, I said, listen, why don't you try to get something more than a C? And he says, the problem with you is that you want A's and B's. He says, I am comfortable swimming through college in seas. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> seas all the way. He just wants to go. From him, from he passes, that is all right. The peacemaker likes to do things the easy way, need respect and self-worth, and is led into temptation when the mate takes him or her for granted and he feels worthless. So, this is how it works now. The common trend is that the sanguine will marry the melancholic because the melancholic is organized and structured and the sanguine is public. Now, the melancholic, for example, a woman who is melancholic, she likes a husband who is on the platform. She's not on the platform. So she will help him with his speech and help him to look good and dress good and help him with the structure and that gives him good support and helps him to look good and, and, and success. So that is what we call complementarity. So we talk about compatibility with those, those issues of age and education and so on. With personality now, differences now can work together. Which is complementarity, sanguine. Then the choleric would normally end up with the phlegmatic because the choleric like order and structure and they are rigid and follow the rules. But sometimes the phlegmatic will help them to relax a little bit. Because the phlegmatic is a peace going person. So, the sanguine, the talker, and, and bear in mind that you have, most people will have two or more of these temperaments, but one is more dominant than the other. So, the sanguine, the sanguine, the talker, will marry the melancholic, the thinker, who will help them with their speech when they're talking, or the supporter, 
who will organize and help them to structure their program. The choleric is the worker, and they will marry the phlegmatic, the supporter. So my wife now and I have a crisis when we started dating because both of us were dominantly at the time. I think we have changed over time because you can change. Choleric, both of us are structured and serious and organized and, and we're just heading there. I remember when a senior pastor met her and she was running everything at NCU, president for CJC club, female student of the year, USM, she was in everything. And he said, he said, Pastor, this girl you're dating? I said, yes. He said, he said, she going, she going, <laughs> she, she going to run your life. <laughs> But, but we have come to some, because when your personality are similar now, you can have clashes. So what we have to do to survive in our homes, and the other personality did, now have become even more dominant. What we have done is that we decide which of these serious managers in charge of what. So inside the house, my wife is in charge. Final decision. So if it has to do with painting inside the house, I do the footwork, but my wife will have the final decision on the color. When it comes to the car, final decision is mine. So we discuss and we share our views, but the final decision in the car. Cutting the lawn and outdoor things, final decision. Education of our children. She's a teacher. She has the expertise. Final decision is hers. That's how we work it out. And we, we discuss, not, not just allowing the person just to make it, but we had to come to that in order for us to. And, I, and also, we have had some changes in how, how, how we, we, our personality. So I am more choleric, phlegmatic. My wife is more choleric, melancholic. So you will see that she's so organized and structured. Um, listen, when we had our first child, he would come to church and he would sit at church. And even now, if we send him with the other ones, he would sit there from 9.15 to after church as a little child and he would move unless mommy said that. I couldn't wait until we have the second one. When we had the second one, because my wife is so prim and proper and we could have sent a table, but the second one, he was not mindful of following those rules. So I watched him as we went to Portmore Church. And those of you who know Portmore Church, how big and long the church is. And that Sabbath, while preaching going on, when the middle one looked down the aisle, and he said, run, while the preaching going on, Pastor. <laughs> and I could see my wife's face as she folded her hand. And he dashed down the thing. And the person, read, people ready to run him down, said, leave him alone. And he went in the middle of the island and he started swimming on the ground. <laughs> and I tell you, he would turn every time, everything in the house upside down. We had to move out center table. And then all of a sudden, I see my wife even on the floor playing with him. And what the other one couldn't throw away anything on the floor. No, he couldn't throw. And things just change. And, and over time, I've seen her change where she's playing more. And, you know, things have changed. And so I know I have been helping her to calm down on some things. Because she's wor she'll work until... There are there's sometimes I don't ask her any question. Sometimes she's at work and I know she's going to break down if she continues. And I call her and I said. Honey, it's time to come home. Yes. Leave the rest until tomorrow. Because she'll work and work. So she, God has placed me in her life. Are you with me? As a, as a choleric phlegmatic to say, take it easy a little sometimes. But there are times when I am more relaxed and she says, you need to spend a little more time on this. So that she give me a nudge. So this is, this, is, this is the type of complementarity that can work in the marriage. So, so that's how you make your selection. Dating. Dating. Uh, sorry. Uh, friendship. Friendship dating. Friendship dating courtship. And you may choose to engage. Because most of the weddings I have done, they, they did not go through formal engagement. Engagement and marriage. But... The selection for a partner in life is not the only selection that we need to make. 
I told you at the beginning, and I will close with this, that we need to make selections not only for a partner in marriage. We need to make selection for success in this life, but we need to make a selection for the kingdom of God. What do you say? And Nicodemus' experience tells us that. I close with this text from uh, John 3. St. John 3. St. John 3 and 1 to 7. Final text for tonight. John 3 and 1 to 7. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And the same came to Jesus by what? And said unto him, Rabbi, what, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he what? Cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of the what? Of the water and of the spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Verse 7 and last. Marvel not at this. That I said unto thee. He must be born again. When you are born the first time. You are born knowing good as well as evil. When God created man. The Bible says everything was good. And that was God's intention. After man's sin, man came to know evil as well as good. So the first Adam as our representative failed. He failed and man sinned and man became subject to death because of sin. The wages of sin is what? His death, man became subject to death. But we die tonight not just because of Adam's sin. We die because of our own sin. Because all have what? Have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So to receive salvation, we must be born again. And I thank God for Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Where the first Adam failed, the second Adam was successful. He came and he was tempted, but he never sinned. He overcame. He was victorious. He paid the price for sin so that you and I might be saved. As we make plans for eternal destiny, we need to choose Jesus. For there is no salvation in any other. But in the name of Jesus. Buddha cannot save. Confucius cannot save. Haile Selassie cannot save. But I heard the songwriter says, We have heard a joyful sound. Jesus says, Jesus says, Let us get that song at this time as we prepare to close. And I'm going to make an appeal tonight for those who want to make a choice for Jesus to receive salvation. While the song is being rendered, just come to receive your prayer tonight. All those not yet given your hearts to Jesus, we want to pray with you as we close.
You want to be saved by the grace of Jesus. Come, we want to pray with you. By the end of this song, we'll be praying for all those not yet baptized, but you want to select Jesus. You want to make him your choice. Come, 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 come. God bless you. God bless you. Come. Is there one more? Come. Thank you for coming. All those who are not yet baptized, thank you for coming, my friend. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come. Back with the living. Back with the I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Come. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Amen, amen. Thank you, parents, coming with their children. Praise God. Amen. someone else. You want to choose Jesus. Not only choose a profession. Not only choose someone to marry. But you want to choose Jesus and eternal life in him. Come. to stand now and to join in singing I'm just a sinner saved by grace while we stand all those who are not yet baptized who want to make their choice for Jesus come the Spirit of God is calling you come all those who are not yet baptized want to make your choice for Jesus come join us at the altar with me as we pray heavenly father we thank you for the message tonight clear guidance on how to make a choice of a partner for life these principles must not be neglected we are reminded that while we contemplate this subject there is a most important choice that we need to make and that is to select Jesus as our personal Savior from sin. So Lord, we thank you for those who are going to read the book and will follow these principles to select persons where they can have happy relationship, successful relationship on earth. But we are rejoicing tonight in a special way for those who are at the altar who are saying, I want to make heaven my home. Not yet giving their hearts to you, but tonight they are taking a stand for Jesus. Receive them, seal their commitment, and help that tonight's step to this altar will lead into your everlasting kingdom. We pray for those who are online who need to serve you also, that your Holy Spirit will move through the airwaves at this time and speak to their minds and their consciences and convict them of righteousness and bring them also to the foot of the cross. That they too will make a full surrender to Jesus. 
be with all of us who have been walking with you. Keep us faithful and true. And when you shall come in the clouds of glory, save us, we pray. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you for coming to the altar, my friends. God bless you. Thank you for coming, everyone. Tomorrow night is the final night for this week. We are looking at parenting the right way. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Thank you, those online, for joining us. May God bless you as you continue to worship with us night after night. God bless you. The subject for tomorrow night, parenting the right way. Amen. Amen. What a message tonight on selecting, making the right selection, selecting the right partner for yourself. Now, I was watching and listening to the message and it was just such an eye-opening message especially as a young person and I took into consideration that we had over a thousand viewers watching us online and I know that tonight's message was indeed a blessing I implore you to join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. as we speak on parenting the right way I know all the parents all the adults all those who plan on being parents you know you guys want you don't want to miss that message you want to tune in and listen right here 13 caledonia road man of seven day mrs church i invite our praise team to join us as we close song